Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Virtual Thursday's Dire Literary Series. And today we are very fortunate to have poet Carla Schwartz with us. And uh, Carla's going to read from her, uh, I guess she's going to read some new poems, but she had a book that came out in 2022, Signs of Marriage. And uh, we'll tell you how to check that out. But um, let's find out a little bit more about Carla. She is a poet. I always want to have like the, the newlywed game background when I read this. You know, Carla is a poet, a <laughs> filmmaker, a photographer, and a blogger. She lives half the year on Unbridge Island in Lake Winnipesaukee and the other half in the Boston area. She's a long distance swimmer, paddleboarder, cross country skier, cyclist, hiker, and haphazard gardener. Carla has a PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton University. Her poems, which reflect life, love, family, death, and the natural world, social issues, and the environment, have appeared in many, many, many places. And if you're super interested in those places, you can go to carlapoet.com and check it out for yourself. And uh, I'm very, very happy to turn uh, the, this part of the evening over to Carla Schwartz. Thank you so much, Timothy, and everybody else who's here for coming. And uh, I, um, yes, I'm going to read you a few poems, many from my new book, which you can't see, Signs of Marriage, um, and as well as a few others. And uh, But since we only have a few minutes to read, I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start with a poem that's not in the book, uh, which is a recent poem that I wrote after the death of Pat Schroeder, a former uh, congresswoman from Colorado. Pat Schroeder was our mother. I want to be ash. I want to be doorstop. If you don't stick to your word, I'll call you Teflon. I want to be ash. I want to be doorstop. I'd be your mother and yours and yours and yours. I want to be ash. I want to be doorstop. I'm no god but crack sunlight through your clouds. For all those who follow my footsteps, I'll stick out my neck. Make me your doorstop. Give me half a seat and think that's half a voice. I can stand and shout, oh, you'll hear my voice. You can give me shit, but I say that it's my choice to eat and swallow what you give and spit it on your feet. I've been a working woman, so clean house as I see fit. When the house burns down, ashes, ashes, I'll be in it. And now I'm going to read you the title poem really of the book, Signs of Marriage, and it's called Marriage Two Signs. Driving south on Route 3, just over the Massachusetts line, I saw two signs hand-painted in red, drain the swamp, probe Obama. The first sign made me think of our front yard in flood this time of year, deep enough for the mallard couple to dive happily dive and dive, oblivious to my snapping photos and how after seeing them there, dining together in marital bliss, I had contemplated ways I might try to drain our little swamped lawn, digging gullies, laying down stones or sand, but the mallards seemed to be doing a fine job, each day a little less water in the yard. I didn't want to drain the swamp anymore, Rather, I wondered how the ducks would fare when the yard dried up. The second sign reminded me of Becoming, Michelle's autobiography, how she laid out her love for all to read, poked, prodded, probed even, so that not only was Michelle likable, her sometimes self-centered, nerdish, cigarette-smoking husband was likable, no, lovable too. And as a reader, you entered their love, understood no one else would probe his almost hairless chest, chest, kiss his lips or gyrate hips on the dance floor. I did not want to probe Obama, 
that's Michelle's domain. And I thought, probe on Michelle Obama, probe on. And this next poem, also in Signs of Marriage, was up at Boston City Hall last year. It's called 2020, Were You to Have Lived? You would have sat down at the kitchen table with my father that January night. Might have been the one to cook dinner for him. And even though he was not feeling well, he might not have been so indifferent as to wear his pajamas to dinner. You would have been there when his knees folded under as he tried to stand up, might even have caught him, or you'd have driven him to the doctor that day, or you'd have had more sense than him to stop the both of you from driving by then. You would have had a smartphone, would have taken it in hand, punched up an Uber, and when my father recovered, you'd sit calmly discussing whom to vote for, Bernie or Kamala. When the pandemic shut everything down, you would have worn masks among strangers, maybe taken strolls around the block. But when you'd learned about George Floyd and Rebiana Taylor, you'd remember the Nazi soldiers with their guns bursting into your home, would have mourned for lives lost, mourned for, not, for, mourned for being too old to stand and protest. The two of you would have kept company, might have handled You'd have handled the technology, ordered meals, played the piano, video chatted with your friends. But by then, you were long dead. And when my father's knees buckled him to the floor, as he lay there unable to rise, he might have looked up and heard you call to him when the ambulance came. And this next poem is coming on the heels of the 10th anniversary of the Boston Bar Marathon bombing. And it's a sort of different perspective on it. Uh, it's called Contemplating Humanity While Swimming. After a mile, I stop paddling and drift. I strap an orange swim buoy around my waist and then don the do goggles, gloves, fins. Like a mink on a rock, I slip off my board, begin arm over arm on my back, towing the board behind me. The wind tickles the water's surface. In the cool air, I can't help wonder if there's snow on top of Mount Washington. Alan's admonishment gnaws at me. You can't write a poem that considers the humanity of a terrorist, a poem that prays for a sinner like what Taha does in Revenge. I think about Tsarnaev as a teen, said to have been gregarious, funny. He probably watched cartoons as a boy. Then as a young man, his brother whispered, bomb. In cartoons, an explosion singes a finger, a wall crumbles, but the hero walks away unscathed. To calm my stitch, I take deep breaths. I'm on a beautiful lake surrounded by mountains. I flip over and swim crawl. I want to better understand lapses in judgment, including my own. I think about what it means to be human. Um, I'm going to read just a, a couple of more, I think. So I'm going to read to you a poem, again from uh, Signs of Marriage, which is called Raspberries. As a man and a woman meet in the afternoon, safely distanced across a raspberry patch, they pick and taste, melt berry to tongue, lean in and stretch to reach a laden branch some distance into the heart of the stand. As they pick, they move round and round the berries, a berry dance. With raspberries, you must circle more than once to find what you've missed the first go round. They speak not of the heaviness of the years lost between them, begun around some other patch of fruit, not of their diaspora, not their chance reunion. No, hell no, raspberries, only raspberries. I tell you these two, they swallow the droplets, ignore the scratches, 
between fingers, they pinch the flavor. So Timothy, do I have time for any more? Is that, are we done? Do one more, it's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think I will do one from my first published book called uh, Mother, One More Thing. So a lot of the poems there speak to the concept of mother. And this is in another raspberry poem and it's called A History of Raspberries. Frances lived in a little house between Route 9 and the Pike. She'd been there 40 years through two kids grown and gone, husband dead, cigarette habit dead, but her plantings thrived. She was thinning raspberries one year and offered me some. I made a place for these to compete with my wild blacks, which I could take or leave. When I lived in Vermont, I planted raspberries in front of the bathtub Mary. I don't know what the nuns next door thought about that, but those berries were good. It took three years before the first berries arrived, one October, just barely before the first frost. In November, I put two soft plump ones into a silver cardboard ring box to bring to my mother, sick in hospital. Her eyes lit on them as if they were holiday ornaments or truffles or cherry stones on the half shell. Now Francis is dead, lung cancer, mom, leukemia. I get a summer and fall crop of raspberries. I had berries into December this year. I still have the red stained box, each bite a sweet tart burst. Francis, my mother, bathtub Mary. So um, I guess I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, we have a few questions in the chat. You don't have to look at them. I'll get to them for you. Okay. Um, first one is from Dick. How does your research work as an engineer inform your writing? That's a great question. Um, I, it hasn't informed a whole lot of my poems, but it has informed some of my poems. Um, I have written some more scientific poems. Um, I also used to write about uh, being a a um, a woman engineer, uh, and uh, I when I did my PhD it was a long, long time ago, and there were seven people in my program which is a particular aspect of electrical engineering. And there were only uh, one woman, there was me in that year. And then there were two other women in other years, you know? And uh, so the men would all play basketball together. And I felt like, okay, so they're like proving theorems in the shower, you know? <laughs> okay, <laughs> And I didn't have that opportunity to prove the theorems in the shower or my PhD supervisor loved to play darts, you know? and go out drinking with the boys, his boy students, his men students, and um, and play darts. And I wasn't included in that, you know? So I felt like a little excluded. So I have a lot of poems that are about sort of growing up in the world of men. Um, and even, I think I wrote a recent poem, uh, you know, about that. Just, um, I be asked to sit on NSF panels and I felt like I was the token woman and things like that. So. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. But it's not no direct uh, 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 relationship per se. And I um, started writing poems when I was eight, like a kid, you know, really. So I've been writing a long time, much longer than I was uh, uh, an engineer. And does the physical activity of distance swimming affect your writing at all? It Yes. In fact, I have actually written a few poems while swimming, you know, where I, I there, it doesn't happen very often or poems or I, I used to be a runner too. So I would run and I would just, something would come to me and I would repeat it and repeat it as I was running until I memorized it and I'd go home and write it down. You know, um, that was before you had people carried their phones and they could speak to their phones and all that stuff. But um and uh, so I've written a few songs that way because I, I do occasionally write songs and, um, you know, while I was swimming. And then I also get ideas while I'm swimming. And lately I've been getting a lot of ideas or I seem to be doing a lot of writing right when I wake up in the morning. I seem to have uh, a number of ideas that I can, I work out. 
I'll ask a part of Robert's questions. I, what do the raspberries mean to you? Not the music group the, in their poems. And are they an aphrodisiac? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, raspberries, uh, I don't know that they're an aphrodisiac, but they could very well be, you know, <laughs> it depends on who you are and what your feelings are about raspberries, I think. But um, I have written, I think I've written, and in my books, there are at least, you know, five I've written at least five or six poems about raspberries, maybe more. And uh, I had this patch that started just like it says in that poem, uh, a woman gave me these raspberries. Um, and, um, and I, oh, but before that I had raspberries in Vermont. I lived in Vermont and I grew raspberries very easily. And then I moved to, to Framingham, Massachusetts and I didn't have any. And this woman gave me some and you know, they didn't do very much at first. And then I had, by the time I left that house in Framingham, I had this amazing raspberry patch. It was just, it would give me the most amazing raspberries and just tons of them. And I, I was so happy. And so, so there's also for me, there's a lot of loss involved when I left, I sold that house and I left my raspberry patch, you know, so there's I, not only do raspberries mean something to me because I love the fruit, but, and they are, you know, I have some memories of them, but they also mean something to me because um, I had to leave them behind, although I took little samples from the plants and I moved them to where I live now, some on the island on New Hampshire and some here in, I'm in Carlisle, Massachusetts right now. So where you've lived in a lot of spots, what's it like living in an island that you have to get to by boat and how large is this island? It's probably great for riding, but what's it not great for? Actually, you you can't ride a bike. I mean, there are a few people that have ridden bikes on. There are eight miles of trails on it, but it's not really a biking island. But you definitely can't drive on it because there's no roads and there's no bridge. And um, so, um, but uh, some people have those kind of four wheel off road tractor kind of things for, for you know, yeah, really, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, but what we do because we have one slip even though we have this solar powered houseboat which is this dark thing to my to that side of me right here you can see that's sort of the awning of the solar powered houseboat in that picture um but so we do go around in our houseboat but we don't have a slip for it so we have to um ride um we have to ride our um we have a slip that's either wide enough for one small boat or two kayaks. So if we want to go back and forth and not necessarily come back at the same time, where you'd have to coordinate that because it's two and a half miles by uh, boat to our to our little house on this island, which is not small, eight miles in circumference, about 200 homes on this island. Um, so uh, we would have to um, coordinate it. And otherwise we have two different kayaks. They're both pedal kayaks. So it's sort of, that's where I get my biking in. In the summertime, I'm pedal kayaking. Mine's a Hobie. So it's like, um, it's like a recumbent uh, Stairmaster. Your feet are going like this. And, um, and so it's very, uh, you know, it's nice. It's a nice way to get around. Um, and, um, and uh, I usually, so uh, mine's a tandem, except that I, when I'm running just by myself, I just have one seat and then the front part of it, it's a sit on top. So I put all these groceries in the front and that's how I get the groceries back and forth. And, um, you know, it, it takes half an hour, 40 minutes, but then you're, you know, that's it. You're, you're there and it's, um, it's, it's fine. It's nice, you know, and, um, and, uh, and then you're on this island where there are some deer. And I saw pictures this year of bobcat in the wintertime and there's some fox there too. Um, coyotes, I guess. We haven't seen those in the past. And actually bear, last summer there were some bear. On, and it's Bear Island is the name of the island too. Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, island life is very special. Um, yeah, I have I'm terrified there's a bear. We haven't seen any on our property, but we did hear about, you know, neighbors having issues. So, um, yeah, we're lucky so far. Um, so, so you had a new book come out in 2022, The Signs yes, of Marriage. Yes, and before yes. that, Intimacy and Wind came out in 2017. Earlier, we spoke of 
Yeah. Um, how nice. writing has changed and how your writing has changed. So where does the new book go where the other one did not? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the new book, uh, although it's, you know, it's a chat book, I feel like it's, um, it's my best book to date is in my mind, you know, uh, but um, the themes on that book are, um, they're similar in the sense that I do write, I have not stopped writing about my mother who died in 2007. I haven't stopped writing uh, about um, couples being a, in a couple. Um, and I, I wrote more about my father in this book, though, than I have in other books. And um, and then um, I do, I am an appreciator of nature uh, in general. And so, and I do a lot of swimming. And so I do have a lot of nature informing my environment in general and so forth, informing my, um, my poetry. Uh, the Intimacy with the Wind book I wrote after uh, being nomads on Lake Champlain in 2015. My partner and I were nomads all summer of 2015 on Lake Champlain. And so in the cover of this book, hard to see here, let me just there. Okay, that's our houseboat on Lake Champlain, little picture of it. And um, hard to see, let me get closer there, there. And, yeah. um, and um, I'll put links to everything in the chat in a, in a second. But um, so uh, I got the title for that book by, I was reading David McCullough's biography of the Wright brothers that summer. And uh, he had this quote from Wilbur Wright that, you know, in order to understand the wind, you, in order to understand flight, you really have to understand the wind. And uh, that's where I got this intimacy with the wind. And because we also, even though we weren't flying, we had this electric motor, solar powered boat, electric motor, we can go three miles an hour. And um, we needed to be able to um, overpower, overcome the uh, the wind. And often the winds in, on Lake Champlain prevail from the south. And so we, in our past experience, prior to being on Lake Champlain, we would be able to go back and forth, north and south on a lake, for example. On that lake, it was very hard to move south because the winds prevailed from the south. So, and sometimes 20 miles an hour, big rollers, and we have this little boat, you know, so we always had to like figure out what the weather was doing before we made our next move. And uh, so that was, that was what drove that. So I, it, that book is also about relationships and about nature and the intertwining of the two. And then that book, Mother, One More Thing, a lot of it came from the concept of, I felt, you know, having my mother having passed away that I still had so much I wanted to say to her. And so, and so that's really where a lot of those poems came from. And, the, and I have another, you know, chapbook that I haven't published yet, you know, and it's called Mother One Thing More, you know, <laughs> I still keep talking to her. So now you're also a filmmaker and your films uh, that you've done with your poetry or other films that you have 2.4 million views on YouTube. So have you ever considered doing like a podcast or another show of that kind? Because you have some followers, it sounds like. I do. And it, it, uh, now, if we answer Dick's question with respect to the films, we might have a little better um, uh, coordination there, which is that um, my films vary. So I will have... I have thought about podcasts because I, you know, everybody has one these days, but, um, and, um, but I, I haven't. Well, what, is, and, what is the question that Dick asked? Cause it's not on the regular so, chat. Sorry. Dick asked me, how did my PhD in electrical engineering and being doing research in electrical engineering influence my poetry? Now in my videos yes, that, on my video that. channel I write I do a lot of instructional videos I do informational and instructional videos and DIY videos and so it's a it's sort of a mix I do have videos I haven't separated my channels so basically my channel is very varied and so I have the two I'll put in the chat the two um, promo videos that I made for my two poetry books for two of my poetry books I made promo videos so you can see those videos which are I enjoy them. And then um, then I also have um, this uh, series on going solar, 
you know, how to the different ways that you could go solar. And I made these a few years ago and, that, you know, some of that has changed a little bit depending on what the companies are doing. But it gave you an idea of, you know, if you wanted to rent out your roof or if you wanted to own the panels and so forth, what your options were. And then um, and the 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 other thing that I'm working on right now, I have a series of uh, videos with my partner on the monoblock heat pump that we installed in our house to replace our gas boiler for doing our radiant floor heating. And, you know, and so these are technical things. Now, not that I would have learned and understood these things when I was studying electrical engineering per se, because I was really more on the mathematical side of things. But on the same, on the other hand, you know, I, I have a, 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 a technical technical aptitude enough to be able to explain a lot of these things. So that's what I do uh, in some of these videos, but I also have cooking videos, which are instructional, which are very fun. Um, and uh, the, so some of my videos have many more views than others, and I haven't done even the counting recently. So it's probably higher than 2.4 million in terms of my total sum view of all of my videos. But, um, but uh, you know, some of these topics are very popular. Um, I have one you know, like a composting toilet, you know, how to use this particular composting toilet. You know, it's like, and it, you know, has thousands of views, 75,000 views or something, you know, it became very popular. And, um, you know, and then I cook on induction. So then I have some videos about how to cook certain things on induction and instant pot cooking. I'm very big on that. And um, so that's, uh, that's where it's at. It's very well-rounded. You also have poems you offer as NFTs. Now, I always advise people like, well, if you're Stephen King or uh, Barack Obama or someone that has uh, a lot of literary, um, you know, it'd be great for NFTs and like Stephen King can become an even bigger billionaire. But um, with all the blockchains and whatnot, is it a good model for people like me to make any money? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I have not made a cent. And, um, and uh, but, um, you know, a lot of people are in favor of, you know, this as being able to share um, collections of poems that way. And that, and um, <laughs> there you go. Dick it's very, says it's no. very cult. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, the NFT people is like this cult. They're like blockchain, blockchain. I'm like, there, no one's going to give a crap about my blockchain. Right. Something about it is cultish. It is it is a way to share your work very publicly, you know, very easily, you know. That's so, great. Um, you know, and I think um, I think social media in general is a good way to share your work, too. You know, you have to be willing to to put yourself out there and and. You know, you've heard of SEO, search engine optimization, and yes. hash, hashtags. And you know, you, you if you get the right hashtags, um, you know, you could potentially uh, do something where something goes viral, or you know, whether it is That's something that you dream. put right, something, something that you put viral. out on social media or on you know as an NFT. And you know, is it that we're out here to make millions, you know, or make even a living? You know, that's that's hard to do as a writer, as you might have found. Maybe you have been able to find Well, it. you know, it's just, it's, you know, back to the existential question, does art, should artists get paid? Does art make money? Did you appreciate art? Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. I, um, you know, I, I actually follow, I don't know if anybody follows the Boston Dynamics uh, robots spot, but, um, those those robots are really interesting and and um, so at the um, uh, Melbourne Triennial they have an artist event which is international. There is an artist there who's American who has trained these uh, uh, Boston Dynamics robots, these dog robots, to paint, and she tra she has trained them yeah. to to paint um, her you know the according to her instructions in terms of touch, you know, uh, the amount of the thickness of the brush stroke and things like this. So she's really controlling it on the one hand. And on the other hand, she's, um, you know, she's letting them go to town. And so, um, 
so it's it's kind of an interesting uh, collaboration between artificial intelligence and um, and the artist. And of course, she have, be, being have in that. Have you seen any of the artificial intelligence chat about writing that basically can produce outlines? It can produce uh, like a novel order. It can basically. Uh, do you agree with that as a creative person? Uh, I haven't um, experimented enough with ChatGPT or, and so, oh, I, I, by the way, I tried the Bard and, and so far the Bard is useless, but in case anybody's <laughs> had the, that invitation, but, um, but with, you know, ChatGPT, ChatGPT uh, will occasionally be kind of full of it, you know, uh, not really credible, but occasionally we'll have a lot of experience. And I think it depends on what you're training it on. Um, but I would guess that if you were to throw, you know, your um, novel at it and said, could you organize this into chapters and give me a table of contents, you know, it might do an okay job, at least the first pass, you know, and, um, and I was in a workshop just the other night and the person said, um, I went to chat GPT because I wanted to talk about poems about joy. And so I, I went to chat GPT and I said, okay, give me a, some examples of poems about joy by Linda Pastan and give me examples of poems about joy by Tony Hoagland and, you know, various other poets. And it actually came up with things that were good, you know, good examples. And so that kind of thing, if you were running a class or something and, um, and wanted to get, you know, uh, example poems for a particular area, I think that would be an excellent thing to do. Um, and one thing I haven't done yet, you know, in terms of using ChatGPT, say, to prompt myself to write a poem, um, but I guess people do, you know, work with ChatGPT to to do that. Um, oh, here we have Dick. What, Dick, why don't you say something? You want to answer? Uh, uh, okay, never mind. Oh, whatever. Um, I see he's he's muted. Okay, so I'll read his chat his his comments after. Um, but yeah, so some people uh, do work with the um, with the uh, chat GPT to either generate work or you might try to give it a poem that you've just drafted and see if it can improve it. You know, I don't know if it would do better. You know that. Um, well. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really was wonderful chatting with you and hearing your work. Uh, I want to show folks at home here. The, this is the book that we're at. Uh, Carla was talking about signs of marriage, and there's intimacy okay. with the wind. And oh, great. this is right from Carla's website, CarlaPoet. Dot com. So check it out, everybody. Carla, thank you so much. Thank you. I put yeah. some links, a bunch of links in the chat, which are, you know, I had in my paste buffer. And um, and so those will you be actually put those links too in the, the groups page for Dyer. So the people that are watching it on in the group can can go there and see them. Yes. Yes, I will um I will go to the groups page. That's the the actual closed group page, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I will go there we'll after. Event or something like that so people can enjoy that and, and find out a little bit more. Um, if you're watching it now on the stream on the groups page, um, you can use the link to come in for the open mic. If not, thank you for being here. I know that some of you are on the groups page every single week. So appreciate that. And uh, I am going to cut you guys off right now. So come on in with the link of the open mic and Carla, thanks again. Thank you again, Timothy. I really appreciate it. <laughs>